morning, everyone, or good afternoon. I'm, I'm still jet lagged, so you know, for me it's like night, middle of the night or something. How's everyone doing? Good, good. All right. Don't worry if you accidentally fall asleep because you are jet lagged. We won't call you out or you know make fun of you or draw anything on your face or anything like that. So thanks for uh, joining us. We're here to talk about um, how you would go about explaining OpenStack to a person who is primarily uh, been in uh, the VMware space, right? Um, obviously, VMware has a very large install base in the enterprise, and they have a certain set of kind of um, ways of looking at things. And so, there's a, a large group of people out there um, who have vSphere in their environments, who are looking now at OpenStack, and they may be struggling and uh, scratching their heads on, like, okay, how do I look at this OpenStack thing? What's involved? And so, um, Kenneth and I are here to try and provide some. Uh, as the name implies, bridging the gap, right? Some mapping between OpenStack concepts and terminology and corresponding vSphere um, uh, concepts and terminology. So I'll do a quick introduction. My name is Scott Lowe. I work for VMware. I'm in the Network and Security Business Unit and a member of the OpenStack team at VMware who's responsible for driving uh, VMware integration with and support of OpenStack. And this is my co-presenter. Me? No, you're not on. It's on. Oh, there you go. Okay. Oh, yeah. My name is Ken Hoy. I work at Rackspace. And prior to that, I worked for a company that focused on VMware. So. All right. So I don't think uh, you know, either, neither Ken or I are going to claim that we're OpenStack experts. Both of us have a long history in the vSphere space. Uh, but uh, we think that that might help in providing this kind of this mapping for you. If, if you guys are you know, diehard OpenStack folks, and that's where you've been, and you're trying, having a hard time saying, OK, now I've got some other guys who are diehard VMware folks, and we just aren't speaking the same language. Uh, what we're going to try and do is help with that uh, a little bit today. So before we actually get started, I uh, just want to encourage you guys, feel free to participate, ask questions, uh, interrupt, share your own experiences, anything like that. Um, so you're more than welcome to uh, participate in the session, be very interactive. Feel free to post updates to whatever social media platform that you use, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, whatever, you know, whatever your poison is there. Um, feel free to take photo, photos, videos, whatever. We're going to make this uh, presentation available online after the event, not only through um, the OpenStack uh, organization, the summit itself, but um, either I or Kenneth will publish the slides through like SlideShare or Speaker Deck. So, all right, I'm going to kick off the session um, with uh, a, a look at the architecture, and then I'm going to hand it over to um, Kenneth, who is going to do some stuff on the terminology and then some operational considerations. And again, the focus here is all about um, how do we take the expertise and the experience and the knowledge that you guys have with OpenStack uh, and help make that consumable by folks who have not been exposed to OpenStack. And maybe these may be folks within your own organization who are the VMware advocates. Um, maybe you're not all that familiar with OpenStack either, and maybe you're coming from a VMware background and you're having some problems kind of a, thinking about how this works and why we use different terms and how the operational procedures are different, so on and so forth, and that's our focus. We're not going to be talking about specific technical integrations. Um, there is a, a demo theater going on tomorrow that I'll be doing, and I'll have more on that at the end of the slide deck, um, where we'll talk about specific technical integrations. This is more of a, a people-focused talk, OK? So starting out with the architecture. Uh, I think it's really important to understand, and, and again, if you're in the OpenStack space, you know this, but if you're someone who's coming from a VMware-centric uh, background, you may not be aware, but these, these products have very different origins, okay? They came from very different places, and as a result, those, those origins have had a, a profound influence on how the product has evolved and how the, the solutions evolved. So, you know, vSphere originated as a way to provide virtualized infrastructure, and so everything you see in vSphere is emulating the underlying infrastructure. So we have these constructs, you know, virtual machines. Um, and, and again, Kenneth's going to go into more detail on some of the terminology, whereas in OpenStack we talk about instances, right? And, the, and, and there's more than just a name change here. There's actually, it's, it's a, a reflection of the underlying um, architecture and kind of the, the mindset or the idea that was behind the creation of each one. OpenStack um, originated as a way to provide consumable infrastructure services. And so we saw, uh, how many of you guys were in the keynote this morning? Saw the um, you know, acronyms as a service, right? <laughs> So uh, sometimes we get this whole as a service thing a little overblown, I think. But it really is applicable when we talk about the OpenStack architecture that it was intended to provide services, um, not necessarily intended to provide infrastructure. We don't expose the infrastructure as much in OpenStack as you would see with a traditional virtualization solution like a vSphere, Hyper-V, or something of that nature. Um, instead, it's much more abstract. And so as you're talking to folks who don't have a lot of OpenStack experience, 
and, and perhaps they're coming from a VMware background, what we really want to do is we want to get them out of this mindset. Right now, they're in a mindset of, I have a hammer, and therefore everything looks like a nail. Um, it's a very common saying in the States. It may not be quite so common outside the States, but uh, we want to break them out of that and break them away from this one tool that they have, which is just this tool to provide virtualized infrastructure, into something more like this, where they have a collection of tools, and each of those collection of tools is designed to fulfill a specific purpose. Um, generally speaking, you're not going to use a screwdriver for the same thing that you would use a hammer for. Now, I have known people to do that. It generally doesn't turn out well. All right, and so everything we talk about as you're talking to these folks is helping them break out of the, the one tool mindset into this idea that these have very different purposes and therefore evolved to, uh, in very different ways. So let's um, talk about what I, what I view as some of the key architectural attributes that really make a difference when you're talking OpenStack versus uh, VMware, right? And this is, again, um, you know, taking what you guys are very familiar with here, uh, and I'm not here to, you know, to go into great detail on the OpenStack architecture because there are other folks here that are far more qualified than I to do that. But these are kind of the key attributes that I think really make a difference. When you're talking to someone who has VMware experience and they're prominently a vSphere administrator, and that's what they cut their teeth on, these are some key things I think that are different that you want to point out, right? First of all, this is a, a loosely coupled architecture versus a very tightly coupled, and I have a diagram to talk about that in more detail. It's, again, a reflection of the origin of, the, of the, what's being built. So where OpenStack came from was a very different place than where vSphere came from. And it's evolved in different ways. But one of those attributes is the fact of the way the, the code comes together in a variety of ways. Um, API driven, obviously, everything is, is driven through the APIs, right? Um, inherently built to support multiple hypervisors. Um, obviously, vSphere, well, it is a hypervisor. So not, not built to support multiple hypervisors. Um, by the way, if you want more details on the specific hypervisor support, there's a link there to the hypervisor support matrix on the OpenStack wiki. Uh, multiple disk formats, this is a, kind of an offshoot of the fact that we are supporting multiple hypervisors, so we have to support multiple disk formats as well. Um, and the idea that networking is really more integrated, especially when we start talking about how Neutron um, is evolving, it's much more about um, networking being very consumable without having a deep um, view of the underlying infrastructure, and I'll talk more about that um, after uh, Kenneth takes some time talking about terminology and operations. So just from a diagram perspective, um, this is a very common diagram. You've probably all seen it before. I actually um, uh, was standing next to Ken Peppel, who's the author of this diagram, uh, this morning while we were waiting for the expo session to come out. So thanks for the diagram, Ken. Appreciate that. Um, there's his link down there where you can find the diagram. But this kind of just shows you, uh, you know, it's, it's a conceptual overview of what OpenStack looks like. Nothing new here. You're, you're probably all very familiar with this. Um, so uh, was there a question? No, just stretching? Okay, that's fine. No worries. Uh, you're probably all familiar with this, so no big deal here. No new surprises. But... Uh, what I wanted to do to present this to you and why I put this up on the stage was, or on the, sh on the screen was say that this is what you guys are familiar with, right? But this is what a VMware person is familiar with. All right, so let, let's, let's flip back just to see, right? This versus that, right? Two very, very different architectures. Now, we could have long, lengthy, religious debates about which architecture is better or worse, and that's not the point of this discussion. The point of this discussion is to say that if you grew up with this, and this is what you've become very accustomed to, and you're talking to someone who is more familiar with this, there's naturally going to be a disconnect in what you guys are saying, right? So hopefully the, 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 kind of the Rosetta Stone for you will be this, right? Where we take those components that a VMware uh, vSphere administrator is familiar with and begin to map them on their corresponding pieces where it makes sense onto what you're familiar with as an OpenStack um, architect or OpenStack administrator. I'm sorry? Blocks and rearranged. Blocks and rearranged. OK. Um, so uh, you know, there, there's some pieces that don't have a direct correlation. For example, there's no object storage platform inside vSphere. Um, doesn't mean you can't use one. It's just that the product doesn't come with one, whereas that was an integral part of what OpenStack came with, right? And so as you're talking to a VMware administrator and you're talking about architecture, you want to take in kind of just in consideration that you know, when you talk about dashboard um, or, or horizon, depending on whether you're using the official name, which is another point of confusion, whether we use the official name or whether we use the code name, right? We talk about Nova Computer or uh, OpenStack Computer, we talk about Nova, um, and that throws them for, for a loop as well if they're not familiar with it, um, is that you have to understand, you know, they, they may have a very different concept. You know, they, there is no concept of a dedicated block storage service in vSphere. Block storage is just considered part of what the hypervisor does, right? So we go back to this architecture here. 
ESXi is the underlying hypervisor inside vSphere, and it's, it provides block storage to the VMs, and that's just how it goes, right? Um, and this, again, dates back and, and kind of traces back to the underlying origins and architectures and purposes of the product. But here you can see some brief mapping, and hopefully that'll kind of give you guys some ideas of when you're talking OpenStack architecture with a vSphere administrator, this might help provide some of the glue that is necessary to help them understand. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Kenneth here now, and he's going to talk about some terminology differences. Sure. Take Thanks, it away, Scott. sir. Okay. So before I get started, just a very quick survey. How many of you here administer or install um, VMware vSphere on a regular basis? Okay, that's a good percentage. How, how many of you do OpenStack? Okay, looks like the same hands. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to walk through a little bit of some of the key terms that exist in vSphere and key terms that exist within OpenStack. And I'm pur very purposefully using the term vSphere as opposed to VMware, because as I like to tell people, VMware is a company. It's not a technology. So vSphere is the technology that tends to be talked about when you compare with OpenStack. And so, again, another caveat is I'm going to be we're focusing specifically on vSphere, which is vCenter with EXXI. So it's, there are things in here that you may say, well, you can do that with vCloud Automation Center or vCloud Director, but I'm, we're narrowly focusing right now on vCenter with EXXI. So, so a couple of things on, on, the, uh, on the right or to your left. <laughs> Right? It's a typical screen of what it looks like once you deploy a VM. Uh, so if you think about the origins of vSphere, right, the idea really was how do we uh, most efficiently use excess physical capacity on a server. So the idea was I'm going to carve up those physical servers into virtual servers. And I basically get a bare machine. And again, think of it, this is at a time when, or still is, when companies are very much siloed. So the idea was a VMware admin may carve up by create a virtual machine and hand it off to another group that actually does the OS, right? And then later on, the, the concept of templates came in to try to help kind of speed up the deployment process. In contrast, OpenStack kind of started from the very beginning with this idea of we are here to deploy not just bare virtualization server, virtualized servers, but deploy an OS that you can install an app on. So here, what, what, there's no concept of deploying a machine with no operating system on top, right? You, when you deploy, when you choose to deploy an OpenStack instance, you actually have to choose an OS image that sits on top when that instance is launched. Any questions about that? Pretty clear? Okay. Okay. Another thing you'll notice, right, in the, in the VMware, in the vSphere world, typically, the, the, all the virtu a lot of the virtual machines are purpose-built. So you have a machine that runs Oracle, so you're going to deploy it with eight cores and 120, you know, 64 gigs of memory. And then you have maybe some file and print servers that only need four gigs of RAM and two C one, one or two CPUs. So the idea is as you walk through a vSphere deployment, right, you would typically create uh, the, act the actual VM specs as you go, and then maybe uh, start copying images on them. In OpenStack world, right, there's the concept of flavors. So flavors are basically like a, think of a service catalog where you choose items off a shopping cart. So the idea is you can pick a flavor that corresponds to a specific CPU, virtual CPU or virtual RAM specification, and that's what you deploy the image on. And the key here is for OpenStack to really work in your environment, the assumption is you have a standardized infrastructure. Right? Instead of giving people 200 choices for the type of instances they want to spin up, you give them six. <laughs> and you try to get them to, to use those because it more easily works when you, uh, when you deploy them. Any questions about the differences? No? Okay. So templates and images. So again, in the, uh, as vSphere has kind of matured along the way, right, it's kind of developed the idea of using these templates to spin up VMs with OS on top of them. In the, likewise, in the OpenStack world, although they had it from the very beginning, it's the concept of, uh, of again, OS images in a repository called Glance. And what's one of the things you'll notice here is that whereas in the VMware world, in a vSphere deployment, 
the images kind of sit with the vCenter server. In the OpenStack world, those images can sit on any, any device you want, or any, uh, sorry, any file repository that you want. It could sit on object storage, it could sit on block storage, it could uh, sit on an NFS share. Uh, and the key there is, for example, in, uh, with the latest release of, of OpenStack, you can, actually deploy, you can actually store an image in a public cloud system. And so that enables you to do um, image portability. Right? Uh, again, the idea being a, a cloud environment with usually more than one data center or one location. Questions? Virtual disk environments. As, as Scott mentioned, in the, again, because of the origins of vSphere and the XXI, the concept was this is a, basically a server with attached storage on it. So if, when you talk, as you guys may know, when you look at vSphere, basically everything is a SCSI disk, no matter what the backend storage may look like. Whereas in the OpenStack world, the, the underlying storage is pretty much divorced from the instance itself. So you can have different storage services that map to different use cases, like object storage, block storage, and uh, ephemeral storage. Any questions? Does this make sense? So as, you, so as you talk with a, if you're an OpenStack guy, or you're talking to a feast for admin, or you're a VMware guy, try to understand OpenStack. It's pretty important to understand this concept, again, of that loosely coupled. So the storage, the storage services for OpenStack aren't as tightly, in, uh, tightly tied in. So you can use a, a lot of different options for how you want to deploy instances. Um, yeah. Things I, I'm from a VMware instructor. One yep. of the things that I find when I'm trying to explain this to people that have a VMware background is that they may have no clue what exactly we mean by object storage. Right. What's right. object storage? So that, that's when trying to explain it to them, that's yep. often a, a whole separate topic. Right. So yeah, so the so the uh, comment was because in the in the end in the VSphere world, ev mostly everything's looked at as a SCSI disk, <laughs> right? There's no concept of object storage per se. So sometimes it's hard to explain to a VM VSphere guy why you would need objects, what it is first of all, and why you would need it. So I actually have a, a section that talks about that later. Okay, so we're going to talk about operations. So how many of you heard the kettles kettles versus pets analogy? Yes. Okay. Some of you have, right? So the very, um, very simple concept, right? VSphere, again, because of where it's grown up, it's, it's essentially custom v, uh, virtual machines that you need to take care of. You know, you may have a legacy application like an Oracle instance that sits on that virtual machine, and the last thing you want, right, is for that virtual machine to get sick <laughs> um, because, then you, because it's not a trivial process to move that database necessarily sometimes off to another machine. Or another, often, often that particular hypervisor node to another hypervisor node. In, in the uh, OpenStack world, there's the concept of cloud instances. Right? Basically, you don't, really, you don't really care about those, those VMs. Right? If a VM has problems, you, should, you basically kill it, and we start another VM somewhere else. Right? And there's a lot of, I'm kind of simplifying it, but there's a lot of concepts behind that. Right? Because for this to work, in the OpenStack cloud world, if the assumption is being made that you have an application that can live across multiple instances, which is why no one single instance matters that much. Right? Uh, so a good example would be if you're running a, uh, a next-gen database like a MongoDB or React where you're going to have triplicate copies. So if one of the machines that have one of the copies is having problems, don't worry about it. Just kill it. Because right? you're going to continue running on the other copies, then you just bring up a new instance and reattach the database, and you're off on your merry way. Right? There's no concept of, let's, let's see what we can do to try to fix that VM. We don't care. Hey, Kenneth, before you move on, to, yep. you know, you're, Kenneth and I were talking before the session, and, and most people apply the kettle versus pets analogy when it comes to the instances or the VMs, but you can look at this a variety of ways as well. I think in, in, in the people that I've talked to deploying, you know, any sizable OpenStack instance, and, and we run an OpenStack cloud inside, um, inside the network and security business unit at VMware that, that we use for dog fooding and all kinds of other things. And it's a, you know, I would say it's huge, but it's fairly sizable. The other way we look at this is the applying the cattle versus pets analogy to your actual hosts, right? Um, typically in, an, in a vSphere environment, you know, the, the SXI hosts are kind of 
You, you look after them, you make sure they're patched, you take careful care of them, all this kind of jazz. But in, in a lot of OpenStack environments, it's like, oh, another hypervisor is dead. Uh, just, just kill it, we'll spin up another one, right? And of course, there's a whole set of operational procedures that are far more common in OpenStack environments, like the use of configuration management tools and that sort of thing, than typically are in a vSphere environment. And I think that's because of this underlying sort right. of approach to that. So uh, this analogy, I think, is applicable not only to the virtual machines, but also to the host. Good point. Yep. And the key here is this is probably, the, our, is this probably one of the most important concepts for, people to, for you to understand or for you to explain to a vSphere administrator. If they don't understand that difference, right, OpenStack, it's going to become frustrating <laughs> for you because it does, is not going to have some of the features that you may expect in a modern hypervisor. So, and, and I'm going to talk about some of those in a minute. Okay, so the, I talk to probably 80% of my conversations with customers uh, involve VMware in some way. And the number one question I, I get asked is, what happens when I put my Oracle server on KVM in OpenStack and the, uh, and the, server, and the, and the hypervisor know underneath it dies? And the answer is, then you're down, <laughs> right? Because it's a single, it's a stateful single instance application, uh, single with no replicas like you would do with MongoDB. And so I, when I tell them that, the first thing they ask is, is what's wrong with OpenStack? <laughs> and the answer I give them is nothing, right? Because if you go back to that cattle versus pet analogy, the concept here is that we don't think, and in the OpenStack world, we don't think application resiliency belongs in the infrastructure layer, it belongs in the application layer. Right? The assumption in OpenStack is a VM could die anytime. And so you, you want to make sure that in the application side, that's how you handle when a failure occurs. So that's why there's, no, there's not much, have been much of a focus on getting that kind of restarting, automatic restarting of VMs. So the closest thing to what you may think of as an auto restart of HA is something called instance evacuation. And the concept of instance evacuation is this. Let's say I'm, if I'm running, let's say, KVM, and I'm using KVM a lot in my illustration because KVM is deployed in between to 70 to 90% of all OpenStack deployments today. When, it in, when instances fail or hypervisor node fails, there's an, there's an ability to manually move VMs to recreate them on another, on another hypervisor node with the same metadata on it. But it's a manual process, again, because the underlying uh, assumption is you've, that application has never gone down on those, on those uh, VMs that were on the failed node, right? They've been running all along. They've just rebound, removed. Uh, they've been running on the replicas on the other hypervisor nodes. So there's actually no rush in one sense to, get, a, to get, a, uh, get the VMs back up again. Right. So, and there's two, two types of evacuation. There's one with shared storage and one without. In the shared storage, you basically retain the data, user data that you had attached to those VMs. Any questions about it? So that, does that make sense why you don't have freestyle HA? Yeah? What's the difference between instance evacuation and shared storage and VMware HA? It sounds like very similar concept. Except, well, so in vSphere HA, is an auto is an automatic process, right? And you basically, a VM just kind of restarts in, on another node. In, uh, in the OpenStack world, in instance evacuation, it's a manual process. You actually have to run a command to get the IDs of all the VMs and then restart each one, unless you script it. And, and that's by design. That's, right, because there was, there's no, there was no need to have an auto HA function because the applications are going to fail over on their own anyway. So. Any questions about that? Okay. So, so I'm sure all of you are familiar with vMotion and storage vMotion, right? So basic concept, move a VM live from one hypervisor node to another hypervisor node. And you typically do it, in, uh, in most cases, in, in terms of maintenance, right? If you want to do maintenance on a Hypervisor node, you move the VMs off, right? Or if you're doing um, a DRS, distributed resource schedule, you may use it to rebalance VMs across multiple hypervisor nodes. So in OpenStack, or KVM world, there's something called instance migration, which is essentially like AV motion. 
Well, you can actually move an instance live from one compute node to another compute node. Again, it's a manual process, right? So, what, so one of the things that I get asked also is, do you have in OpenStack a distributed resource scheduling function where if I load up VMs, I can rebalance them to another EXSI server? And the question is no. <laughs> uh, this is a, again, this is strict, this is really designed for doing maintenance on a, on a specific physical compute node. There's no concept of rebalancing things. But again, the application layer Right, is where you do the intelligence rebalancing workloads when necessary. Questions about how this works? Okay. All right. So a little bit of iChart. So let's talk about the storage piece a little bit quickly. So here's something that, um, that I actually have to take some time to explain to a lot of VMware guys, is that concept of ephemeral storage. So I, again, in the vSphere world, Everything is a permanent, persistent, SCSI disk, right, that, that the EXSI server thinks is locally attached, or the uh, VMs think is locally attached, sorry. But in the OpenStack world, this is actually what came first. An ephemeral disk is basically a, a, a volume that you, that where the, root, where the OS is stored, so it's where the root um, partition is. The reason it's called ephemeral is when that instance, when you terminate an instance in OpenStack, the data is purged. This is gone. And any data that you have on it. Right? So in the vSphere world, you, can, you could uh, kill a VM, and the data would still sit in the data store. But in the OpenStack world, we just assume you don't need it anymore. And again, it's back to that concept, right? Cattle versus, cattle versus pets. That data is probably sitting in multiple copies somewhere else with some other instance anyway. So why bother even keeping it? around, just would be a waste of resources. Okay, uh, just a quick word is some people sometimes get confused and think that when you reboot an instance, the storage goes away, it doesn't, it stays, but the, any uh, changes you've made may get lost, so. Okay, so block storage. So there is a, there is a use case, of course, for having persistent user data. Uh, for certain types of workloads, and that's where the block storage comes in. So a block storage uh, in, in, a, a, uh, in the OpenStack context is basically an iSCSI volume that you can attach to a running instance. So think of it as a, like going up to a, a machine and plugging in a USB drive. So if you want to terminate that instance, you just unplug the USB drive and plug into another USB, into another instance. Again, instances are completely disposable. And the last thing I want to talk about is the object storage side. So how many of you are familiar with object storage in some way, have used it? Good, okay, decent number, right? So really the concept of object storage is what do I do, what do, I do when, I, when I have millions of objects, right? What do I do if I am Workday or a Concur and have millions of receipts, images I got to store? Or I'm Wikipedia, right? And I've got millions of web pages. And when I need to retrieve them, I can't because the file system takes too long to walk the tree. So the concept of object storage is every object actually has all the metadata for it sitting with that file or the object. So therefore, I don't have the scalability limits that I would have with an NFS or a SIF share. So now I can store millions of objects right, and still be able to retrieve them relatively quickly. Right? And, I get, and there's the concept of having multiple copies of this data everywhere. Right, again, so if one, if one set of data fails, I can, I can get it at, at another location. And if you talk to certain people who are in the cloud world, they would say, this is a non-negotiable for cloud. That you have to have object storage because, again, the concept is of cloud is we're scaling workloads for, to a very large environment. So if, if the assumption is you should be able to handle millions of files, you, it's very difficult to do that, if not impossible, if you don't have some kind of object storage back in. Any questions about object storage? No? All right, so uh, Scott's going to talk about networking, and then um, we want to take some time, if we can, to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Kenneth. All right. 
So hopefully you're beginning to get a feel for some of the differences in philosophy and architecture and mindset between a typical vSphere kind of deployment or environment and a typical OpenStack um, deployment or environment. The last area we want to point out is, is specific to networking. And really, uh, as we look at networking, particular with the deployment of Neutron and moving forward, as you look at some of the older Nova network models, uh, you know, Flat and um, uh, Flat Manager and Flat DHCP and VLAN Manager, those are a little more analogous. But one of the key differences here is that uh, networking in vSphere is um, the only term I could really find to use was separate. Uh, and I say separate because um, it wasn't typically something that uh, was done when you were deploying workloads. Now, in the same way, you know, you have to go into OpenStack and, and create your networks and create your routers and create your subnets and that sort of thing before you typically can uh, consume them with uh, multiple instances. But the configuration in, in vSphere was, uh, was always a little more tied to the underlying infrastructure. And, and so you had to make sure that you were aware of what the underlying infrastructure was, that your configuration on the virtual side matched the physical side. If there were mismatches between them, then it caused connectivity problems, that kind of stuff. And you didn't have the, really, the ability to decouple your networking from the underlying physical network. Um, whereas when we look at, and again, especially um, focusing on Neutron and moving forward, when you look at how OpenStack is deployed in conjunction with Neutron, then we have a great deal of flexibility in how we deploy networks and attach instances to those networks um, in a way that's it's very decoupled and isolated from the underlying network, right? And this is without us getting into any discussions about the various you know, plug-in models for Neutron and all that kind of jazz. Um, obviously, that's a, you know, a fairly high-level kind of statement to make there, but um, if you want to talk in more de detail afterwards, feel free to, to grab me. But just to give you sort of an illustration of what we're talking about here, this is probably a diagram that if you've uh, managed a vSphere environment, you've seen it at some point, right? Uh, this is a typical configuration. I, I believe this is actually taken from a, a vSphere distributed switch um, as opposed to a vSphere standard switch. But it shows that we have to know the specific VLAN IDs that are in play, and we have to make sure those VLAN IDs are appropriately configured on the, the uh, trunks or the uplinks going into the servers and all that kind of jazz. And if there's a mismatch anywhere along the way, if you, if you fat finger the VLAN ID or you forget to pass one of the VLAN IDs across the trunk or something of that nature, then things just don't work. And, and it's broken and that's that, right? And even the very concept of having like a distributed switch versus a standard switch is, is very different as well because you know, a distributed switch, you have uh, this, this switching that occurs locally, but the configuration is elsewhere and a standard switch configuration and switching done locally. Um, uh, as opposed to when you look at how uh, it's done in, in Neutron. Now this is a um, screenshot taken from my private cloud, right, which is a couple of VMs running on my, my home lab infrastructure. But uh, this is just running, uh, this is running actually Grizzly, um, not, even, not even Havana, right? And this is the Open vSwitch plugin for Neutron, uh, Quantum at the time because of the release. Uh, but, uh, you know, when I want to go in and I want to create some, some networking, all I have to do is go in here and say, hey, I need a new network and here's the subnet that I want to attach to it. And yeah, I want some DHCP services or no, I don't. And yeah, here's the gateway or I don't want a gateway, whatever it is. And then it's just a matter of uh, going in and saying, oh, okay, yeah, this instance needs to be attached to that network and all the network connectivity plumbing is, is handled for me, right? Uh, because of the way Neutron kind of isolates uh, the, the OpenStack networking pieces from the underlying physical network. I don't necessarily need to know all of these details, um, especially as a consumer, right? Um, I'm just coming in and I'm consuming um, services. And it, again, that goes back to this philosophy, this mindset of OpenStack being designed to provide services that allow you to consume them via your applications. And, you know, Ken pointed out that, you know, the applications are really, they're, they're intended to be distributed. They're intended to be resili uh, resilient and redundant so that the un underlying infrastructure doesn't have to provide those things. So it's a very different sort of mindset in how networking would be approached in a typical vSphere environment versus how you would approach networking in a typical OpenStack deployment using, using Neutron. Um, now, uh, I'll, we'll get into the resources in just a moment and we'll go through these, but before we proceed, are, are there any other questions or any comments, anybody that would, uh, would like to share before we move forward? One in back, yeah? Okay, sure, go ahead. <laughs> Absolutely, so the slide deck is gonna be available, um, if I recall correctly, the OpenStack Foundation will make it available through the Summit site, but then either Kenneth or I will also publish it through our own personal slide share or speaker deck um, sites as well. 
So, yeah, so it'll be available in a variety of ways, absolutely. Not a, not a problem at all. So, any other questions or comments before we move forward? All right, Kenneth, you want to go over some of these resources real quick, and then I'll do the I'm next sure. one. So uh, the first place, if you're thinking about possibly trying this out and deploying OpenStack, and maybe even OpenStack with VM, vSphere and KVM living together, and yes, they can live together. Uh, it's kind of like fighting brother. No. Um, if they, they actually can work well together. So the configuration reference guy, which is new in Havana, so they took, in, they took the hypervisor section that used to be in a computer compute administration guy and moved it out to the configuration reference guide. So you follow that, it'll walk you through how to configure all the hypervisors that is supported by OpenStack. So that you can do that. Uh, so on my personal blog, I've been, I kind of did a series on vSphere with, on OpenStack. So I, you follow that, it walks through a whole bunch of things to consider. And it also talks a bit about the difference between vSphere versus KVM with OpenStack. So. And that series, by the way, it's. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not just saying this because he's up here presenting with me, but it's, it's an outstanding series. If you are a, a vSphere admin, and you're familiar with the vSphere, and you're, you're moving into OpenStack, or vice versa, um, definitely go give those a read. It, it's lots of great information in there, lots of great diagrams. I stole a couple for a document I was creating the other day. <laughs> so good stuff there. Absolutely have a look at that. Um, other sessions and things that are going on here that may also be of interest to you tomorrow, um, Dan Wendland is presenting a session at 8.15 titled OpenStack plus VMware customer success stories and what's next. And at that point, he'll be talking about some of the technical integration points of how vSphere, for example, could be used with, in conjunction with OpenStack. Um, as Ken just mentioned, that is certainly a possible thing and something that's very supported. And you heard uh, Mark Shuttleworth talking about that in the, key work, uh, the keynote this morning. Um, in addition, tomorrow afternoon at 2 p.m., I will be over here at the demo theater, uh, be doing fingers crossed, a live demo if the network gods smile upon me and my latency back to the United States isn't too bad, of um, some new integrations that uh, were released with Havana um, with vSphere and also some stuff that hasn't been released yet that we'll be previewing uh, for upcoming releases as well. So if you're interested in some of the technical side of that um, as opposed to the, the people side that we've been discussing here, then feel free to either hit dance session and or my demo theater session tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock. Here's our contact information. We'd love to hear from you. Feel free to shoot us questions. Hit us up on Twitter or whatever. I think we have a, a little bit of time before the next session comes in. So at this point, we'll entertain any additional questions that you may have. Or you can just take off. Whatever works for you. Yeah, right here. Come on up. <laughs> OK, so the question was, you can deploy with VMware. Um, should you deploy with VMware? And, and really, that's a business use case question, right? Um, you know that, the, as, as Kenneth explained, the, kind of the, the idea behind OpenStack was that this is for multi-instance workloads that are stateless and exist across multiple instances and that sort of thing. Um, if you have applications like that and you want to deploy them on OpenStack running on vSphere, sure, no problem. Um, if you want to kind of shift that mindset a little bit and you want to kind of twist it and you want to deploy some single instance workloads inside OpenStack because you like the way OpenStack kind of packages itself but you want to have a hypervisor that provides some additional resiliency to handle those single instance workloads, that might be one use case where you can do that. It's really driven by use cases, business needs. Great question. Any other questions you guys may have? All right, feel free to grab us afterwards. Thanks for your time. Enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs>